Time to look into the special topic called return on invested capital. So what will you learn in this section? You're going to understand ROIC and decompose its key drivers. You're going to point out the strengths of ROIC and its practical applications, and you're going to follow Warren Buffett's view on ROIC and why he uses it to pick companies for investment. So what is ROIC? Well, ROIC is return on invested capital, and it's a widely used measure to evaluate the profitability of a company. It gives an indication of how efficient a company is at allocating its money to generate return. More importantly, ROIC is an evaluation criteria whether a company creates value or not. That's an important part. Now, how do you calculate it? Well, it considers the net operating profit after tax relative to operating invested capital. So right there, you can see the word operating. This is about measuring the operating performance of a company. And it's calculated by taking the NOPAT divided by invested capital. Invested capital in this case, of course, is debt, equity, and then a small amount is minority interest. So ROIC is operating profit divided by invested capital. And it's derived from the profit margin and from efficiency, right? NOPAT divided by sales and sales divided by uh, invested capital. And we can go down further to see the drivers of ROIC, and we can see revenue, costs, equity, and debt. If we can increase revenue, decrease costs, decrease equity, and decrease debt, we are causing the ROIC to rise. So why not use net profit? Well, recall that we use a net profit for calculating the ROA and the ROE. However, companies with high debt also have to pay a lot of interest expense, which are tax deductible. And this means that net profit differs across countries, companies with different capital structures. So operating profit should be independent of leverage. We're just looking at the operations of the business. So we want to eliminate the effect on profit that's due to financing decisions. No pat allows us to determine the profit from core operations. So how do we get it? Well, it's pretty simple. You already know EBIT, and we multiply EBIT times 1 minus the tax rate. We're taking away taxes because we're saying that a company must pay taxes first. So the EBIT is not available to uh, shareholders and to debt holders. It is available after you deduct the taxes you have to pay the government. So let's look at uh, Hermes in a little bit more detail. We can see the EBIT, 2317, tax rate is 35%. So no pat is 1496. In other words, it's always going to be lower than the EBIT. And we can calculate that over time, and you can see it's rising over time. Now, what's invested capital? Well, invested capital describes the funds provided to a company by both shareholders and debt holders. Accounts payable, other current assets, and non-current liabilities are not considered as invested capital. Also, we deduct cash as it's not needed to run the business. So basically, we could think that cash is really used, could be used to pay back the debt. So let's recall the liability side of the balance sheet. And what we can see from this is that the, if we want to look at the invested capital, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of accounts payable, and we're going to get rid of other current liabilities and get rid of other long-term liabilities. Remember that these, these uh, measures all or these sources of funds are all not interest-bearing. And that's key. When we're looking at this, we're looking at interest-bearing debt. And so what you see is total on the, the right-hand side, you see invested capital is the minority interest. It's just very small. Overdrafts and short-term loans, long-term debt, and total equity. These are the three main sources of funds, and you could really say two main sources of funds. So the result of that is we can understand the capital that's been provided. Now, if a company, company has excess cash and they have investments in other companies, those investments in other companies aren't part of operations, so we don't want to include them. And also, the excess cash simply could be used to reduce the debt right away. So if a company borrows $100 million, but it has $100 million of excess cash, we really could say that the company has no debt because they could immediately pay back that debt. So now let's look at the invested capital for Hermes. And here's what we can see. 
Basically, it's almost all equity, 5966. Only a tiny amount of the other items because the company doesn't really borrow money. Now, if we back out, as I said, the cash and short-term investments and we back out the long-term investments, we can see that the company could, doesn't need all that 5966 in equity. It could actually retire that with the excess cash that it has. So in other words, it could do a share buyback as an example. And that means the true operating invested capital needed to run this business is 2480. So we want to look at the net operating profit after tax of 1496 relative to this operating invested capital. And we're going to see an ROIC of 61.6%, which is pretty damn massive. And it's rising up to 697 this is because the company is highly profitable and because the company is sitting on a lot of cash. So what are the strengths? Well, ROE can be destroyed, distorted by capital structure. You may be comparing two companies but realize, not realizing that one of them is getting the, the ROE performance through leverage. We saw that when we looked at the uh, DuPont analysis. ROA could be distorted also by non-operating items because it's total assets. But we know that we want to exclude the cash. We want to exclude the non-operating assets. And ROIC is not distorted by capital structure. In other words, once we get the a net operating profit after tax, that could be used to pay debt and equity. We don't care about that part of it. So as a result, the measure is more comparable across companies. Now, also, it can be used to assess whether a company creates or destroys value. And I like this part because it helps me to understand that business. ROIC describes the operating return a company achieves. And we have something called the weighted average cost of capital, or WAC, which is the weighted average return that shareholders and debt holders require in order to be enticed to invest in that company. So if a company's actual ROIC is higher than the required return, then it's considered to be creating value. Now think about uh, Aramis right there. We saw that it had an ROIC of about 60, almost 70 percent. What do you think their cost of capital is? Well, they don't borrow much money, so really the cost of capital is equity, and you're probably talking about 15 maybe percent per year is what the cost of that is, and so really this company is very, very value creative. So in the case that the company's return is worse than the required rate of return, it destroys value. But if its ROIC is higher than WAC, then it's creating value. Now, here's an interesting uh, you know, excerpt from financial statements of e Evonik Industries. And it's saying uh, ROIC, which was 8.6%. Now, they call it ROCE, return on capital employed. Capital employed is pretty much the same as invested capital. And it's saying it was 8.6% in 2019, and therefore below the cost of capital, which was 10%. And so from that, we can see that the company's not overcoming the hurdle that they want to overcome. So which segments contribute to or destroyed value in this company? And what we can see is, if you look at this, in 2019, services sector seemed to be destroying value. And the one that was creating the most value was resource efficiency business, and then performance materials. Now, some companies, a very small number of them, really focus a lot on return on invested capital. And I just grabbed this from a company called DFDS out of Europe. I can't remember if it's Norway or where these guys are from, but they do a great breakdown on ROIC, and I highly recommend that you look at that to try to understand it more deeply. Now, other strengths, its usefulness as a value creation metric makes it an attractive measure for investors. Besides, it can be used as a performance metric for determining the bonus of a manager or the success of the business. Also, a research study revealed uh, that the fund manager's preference for performance measures, 77% preferred return on invested capital, or it was referred to 70% of the time, 77%. The only one below that, let's say, effectiveness of capital allocation, that's kind of a vague thing, but cash flow is a little bit more specific. Total shareholder return, a little bit more specific, and that's really ROE. And so those are some of the, and EPS is all the way down, much lower. So ROIC is a highly respected measure. Now the weakness is, ROE is a measure from a shareholder's perspective, but ROIC looks at the firm 
from a total firm perspective. And it doesn't separate out the shareholders' perspective. And so some shareholders may say it doesn't really suit them. And ROIC also does not consider the financial risk of a firm. It's just measuring what's available to the amount of money that's invested in the company. Let's look at our pairs of uh, Facebook versus Alphabet. First, we start with Facebook, and we can see that the company has operating invested capital in 2019 of $46 billion. Now, their total equity that's in the company is $100 million, but they got $54.8 million in cash, meaning the operating invested assets are basically half of the amount of equity that's in the company. Debt, there's none. So this is causing the operating invested capital to come down very low, and that means that the, and of course, the EBIT margin is high at about 39.8, and so it is producing almost a 50% return on invested capital. Now, if we look at Alphabet, we're going to see a little bit lower, but still a very, very strong performance. Louis Vuitton, here we can see there's a moderate amount of cash which means that the operating invested capital is a little bit higher because it's not reduced by so much cash, but it has a strong ROIC at 19.5%, and that's mainly coming from the, net, uh, the EBIT margin, which is very, very strong. And here we can look at fast retailing and see that they have a lower EBIT margin of about 11.7% in 2019, but the higher ROIC is pretty amazing. This company deploys a small amount of assets and a small amount of investment. Now, part of that's because they don't own any factories, but that 50% return on invested capital is massive. You wouldn't think about it. You'd think that Louis Vuitton would be making a lot more ROIC, but in fact, fast retailing is making it. This goes back all the way to the beginning of the whole Finance Made Ridiculously Simple course where we talked about Starbucks versus McDonald's and how companies get competitive advantage. And you can see that fast retailing, through its company Uniqlo and other assets that it has, has been focused on outsourcing, and they're doing it differently from Louis Vuitton, but they're doing it very well. Let's look at Coke. ROIC was really distorted in 2017 at 3.2%, because the tax rate that we calculated was 90%. The fact is that we probably have to make a normalized tax assumption in this case, which may have been about 20 to 25 percent. But I just used the tax rate that I calculated from the financial statement. But that just shows you one of the challenges you face when you're trying to calculate the ROIC, right? For ROIC, you know, what tax rate should you be using? That year's, an average, an expected amount for the future? These are questions that analysts have to think about. But the ROIC was 26.8, pretty good in 2019. And here you can see that Pepsi is a little bit different. They have half the level of the EBIT margin, but an equal ROIC. So you can see that you could be lower in profitability, but just deploy less assets, and therefore you need less paid up capital and, and debt, and, and therefore you could actually produce an almost equal ROIC. So again, there's many roads to get to our result. And many of them can get us there. Now, let's hear what master investor Warren Buffett has to say about ROIC. So he said, we want to buy a great business defined as having a high return on capital for a long period of time where we think management will treat us right. A truly great business must have an enduring moat that protects excellent returns on invested capital. And remember, at the beginning of this course, we talked about a moat. Remember, I showed you a picture of a castle and the water around it. So look for the moats like, Bor like Warren does. Now, what he also said is that if you have a business that's earning 20% to 25% on capital, time is your friend. But time is your enemy if your money is in a low return business. What does that mean? <laughs> Even if they destroy capital a little bit and it goes down to 18% from 20 to 25, you're still making a fantastic return above the cost of capital. And that can compound over time. All right, so what have you learned? Well, ROIC is a measure of operating profitability and is calculated by dividing the operating profit by the invested capital. Operating profit, or also called NOPAT, is independent of the capital structure, and it's based on the EBIT times 1 minus the tax rate because, hey, you got to pay the government first. <laughs>
Invested capital is the funds provided by shareholders and debt holders to run the business, so debt plus equity. Accounts payable and other current liabilities do not belong to invested capital as they're not interest-bearing sources of funds. From invested capital, we can deduct cash, which could be used to pay down debt, so we just say net debt really is what we're calculating. And ROIC is used to determine whether a company creates value or not. If the actual return, meaning the ROIC, is higher than the required return from shareholders and debt holders, which is called the WAC, then a company creates value. If ROIC is smaller than WAC, then a company is considered to be destroying value. Now, the strength of ROIC is that it's not distorted by financing decisions. Rather, it focuses on the operating profit. A weakness is that it is from a total company perspective, and it doesn't separate out the return for shareholders only. ROIC measures, measure builds the foundation of Warren Buffett's strategy and contributes to his success. It can provide information about the long-term competitive advantage of a firm. Congratulations, you made it to the end of this section, and in fact, you are now approaching the end of this course. I really want to congratulate you. It's not an easy task to make it through all of these videos, all of the workbooks, all of the assignments, all of the quizzes, but you've done it, and now you have a much deeper understanding of finance. So what's next? In the next section, I'm going to go through kind of a wrap-up so that you understand where you are and what are your next choices, depending on what you want to do with this new knowledge and new transformation that you've made in your understanding of finance. So, congratulations. One of the things that I tell my kids all the time is you need to be a lifelong learner. I, I did this early in my career, but I've lost, I, I probably lost the edge. I just wanted to get that edge back. And I just wanted to see what the, you know, what, what the new thinking is around. And I don't think it's new thinking. I think it's just new approaches. Um, this is certainly more comprehensive than what I'd experienced in the past. And maybe, you know, 20 years ago, we were all less scientific in the approach. I find this a lot more um, measured and uh, the tools here that you've developed are particularly useful uh, and it makes it a lot easier than what I experienced. What I've learned through this is, you know, you can teach an old dog new tricks.